talk about expert witnesses. Let's take a step back for just a moment for people who aren't lawyers. When we're talking about expert witnesses, every single case we have, especially trust contest cases or, or trustee removal cases where you're dealing with accountings, you're going to need somebody, an expert to come in and testify to, to educate the court about the issues in your case, number one, and also to introduce evidence that otherwise would not be admissible at trial. So let's take the, the classic expert that we use constantly are doctors. We need to have a psychologist or a psychiatrist or sometimes both come in and testify to lack of capacity or whether or not somebody is vulnerable to undue influence. And they have to look at the medical records and make a diagnosis and an opinion. You can't just introduce years and years of medical records in court. First of all, it's hearsay. It's not going to come in. And secondly, the judge isn't going to read it. The judge isn't going to understand all this medical mumbo jumbo. And so you need a, a doctor to come in and say, I reviewed it. And, and in my opinion, this person lacked capacity or didn't lack capacity, depending on what side you're on. But you need it for financial issues too. You need a financial expert. Sometimes you need a forensic CPA in accounting cases. So this is what we're talking about. So I want to break this down into just five general things, actually six things, but at the top five things that you need to do with your experts. And the first thing you have to do, Keith, is you have to make sure that they are qualified. And so this takes some work. Um, there's some, some expert databases you can go to. I personally don't like hiring experts out of an expert database. That's just my preference. Uh, other people have hired uh, experts out of databases all day long, and it works out very well for them. But I like to but, hire. But why is why is that? Is that because you don't you don't know their qualifications for 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 sure? Or? I just don't like at the time of their deposition, at the time of trial, that the opposing side is going to be able to say that I hired them out of some database. It kind of oh. takes away the homework side of things to make sure you're getting the right person for the for the case. And so that's just my view of it. Uh, you know, and somebody else may have a completely different experience, but I like to make sure I'm looking around myself. And, and part of that is asking around. So if you practice in this area regularly, call up a colleague, uh, call up a colleague that you had a fight with in a previous case and the case is over now, make sure the case is over and some time has passed. Nothing more flattering for you to do to call up and show respect to a colleague and say, hey, I'm looking for an expert in this type of case. Have you ever had an expert? And can you give me some insight? Number one, you're you're solidifying to that expert that you're a professional. And yes, you guys fought hard in the case you had previously, but you you really do value their opinion, which you do. And you want to find out if they're willing to share with you experts. Don't be surprised if they turn around and call you several weeks later and ask uh, in return for an expert. So there's nothing wrong with that. So what what are your thoughts on that, Keith? Do you think it's a good idea yeah. to find your own expert that fits and, and ask around? Well, the thing I love about asking around is that you get to pick uh, the brains of other lawyers and find out, hey, how did this expert do when he was in the trenches? So it's one thing to find somebody who's great on paper but that doesn't mean that they're going to testify well. And we've had that experience. We've had experts who are just phenomenal on paper, unbelievable credentials. And then you put them in a deposition or even worse yet, you put them on the stand at trial and they're just terrible. They can't explain anything. They act tentative. They don't handle cross-examination from the other side well. And then you'll have somebody else who has good credentials, but not overly impressive. And they'll just nail it when they're on the stand. So I think by by asking and probing, you can find out who really does well under fire, because that's what matters. You know, you got to put your your you have to pressure test these experts and you want to know which ones can handle the pressure. Yeah. You know, two of the best experts we ever hired uh, in, in different cases over the years, they actually opposed us at one point, and And that's how we found them. And and we took their expert depositions and then we crossed them at trial and we found them to be very good. And so that's the other way you can do this is who who's really done well against you in the past, chances are they'll do well against your opponent in the future. So um, that's that's kind of my first uh, tip is just make sure you, you have a qualified expert and ask around with your colleagues. So the, the second tip I would suggest is that you've got to hire these people early. And Keith, if there's one yes. rule that I violate time and time again, it's this one. And that is not hiring early. And it's human nature because it costs money to hire these experts. And it's not cheap. But 
you know, you're putting a lot of money and time into your case, who better to hire than somebody that's been there and understands the issues and can walk you through them and can even teach you some of the things you need to know so that you're asking better questions at deposition in the case and you're uh, doing better motions in the case and you're able to defeat motions for summary judgment because you have hired these people early. There's nothing worse than having two weeks or three weeks to respond to a motion for summary judgment that's been sitting on the corner of your desk, scaring you for the last few weeks. And now you got to scramble to find an expert to do some type of declaration to oppose it. Well, if you already have a relationship with that expert and they've been retained in the case and you've been working with them all along, chances are the motion for summary judgment hasn't been sitting there overwhelming you because you know how to defeat it. You get on it, you respond to it, you oppose it properly, and you've got that expert right there that you've got that relationship with early on in the case so that you can you know, keep the case moving forward. What are your thoughts on that? If you don't get your expert early enough, you know, that expert might tell you some things that number one is helpful, like you said, but they might also say, I can't make an opinion because I need X, Y, and Z, and you haven't given me X, Y, and Z. And you're sitting there saying, well, I didn't even subpoena that information yet. I better go get it. Well, if you hire your expert early, you've got time to do that. If you wait until the last minute, you know, you may not have time to, I mean, it takes what, 30 to 45 days to get documents under a subpoena from a medical establishment or financial institution. So you might run out of time. Um, So again, the first tip was to, to, you know, make sure you have a qualified expert and ask around about them. Uh, The second tip was to hire them early. uh, And that's the one I, I mess up on time and time again. The third tip I would have is you've got to meet with them on an ongoing basis. And I'm not sure what the reluctance here is. It may be money. It may be optics. A lot of times lawyers want to give an expert uh, a very neutral view of the case by an email and then follow it up with a phone call and give them all the dirt. And then they just want to stand back and let the expert do the work. And like somehow the the expert just magically going to be able to do all this stuff. And these are very bright people and they're very smart. And if they have a lot of experience, they're going to know kind of where you want to go in the case but you've got to meet with them on an ongoing basis. And you can't be afraid of the fact that that's going to come out in deposition. Yes. I, I spoke with with, uh, Mr. Albertson, you know, eight times prior in this case. And I took notes of that conversation and good experts will take notes and the notes will make sense at the time of their deposition. And the reason you want to do ongoing phone calls is you want to make sure that they have all of the information that they are, they need to form their opinions. You want to ask them if there's anything else they're looking for. You want to let them know of any new developments in the case. You want to find out what their status is. You want to know what their vacation schedule is. You, you want to say, hey, I'm anticipating a motion for summary judgment coming in. I'm going to need your help um, You know, a, a, a month from now. Do I have two weeks where I can get you to help me You know, with a declaration so I can defeat the motion for summary judgment? So um, you know, have an ongoing rolling basis meeting with your experts to make sure that they can do the best job for you possible. Yeah. And I think there's two reasons why people don't talk to their experts. Number one, I think they're afraid that the expert's going to say something that goes against their case. And so they, it's almost like they want to talk to them as little as possible because once they hear one good thing, it's like, I don't want to ruin my chances because the next thing out of their mouth might not be good for me. Uh, Number two, any communications you have with your expert witness, if they're a testifying expert is not protected by attorney client privilege. Now, you can have consulting experts, people who are not going to testify, that's covered. But uh, I think a lot of people get freaked out by the fact that these conversations with experts are not covered by attorney-client privilege. Well, there's two ways to to uh, deal with that. First of all, talk by phone. Don't, put in, don't send emails back and forth. And secondly, uh, you're just trying to work with the expert to get them the information they need to give the opinion that you want and you need to know what their opinions are going to be and if they're not giving an opinion that you need you need to tell them i also need you to opine on this topic and let me give you that information and then let's talk about what your opinion is i don't want to tell you what your opinion is i want you to tell me what the opinion is but i do need to let you know where i need your opinions And I need to know from you what information you need to give me those opinions. And then I'm going to call you back and say, okay, now you've looked at this. What is your opinion on this topic over here? And and how does this sound? And then I'm go ahead. 
I, I think that's exactly right. And so if, if you're able to keep that ongoing communication flow open, uh, you're, you're going to learn the bad facts. You know, you said you didn't want to hear the bad facts. You should want to hear the bad facts yeah. from your expert, because those are things that you can help bolster in your case as you're moving forward. So uh, after you have an ongoing basis with them, ongoing meetings, that's all good. Let me get to the fourth point that I, I would have. And, and Keith, this is where I see many, many lawyers making mistakes. And I made this, this mistake only once. Uh, it's a painful mistake. And that is not giving your experts all, all the materials in the case. Now, it's understandable why lawyers don't give experts all the materials. Why is it that lawyers don't give experts all the materials? Well, for two, um, the biggest reason is they don't want the experts spending time reviewing all the materials because it's expensive. These experts charge anywhere from 700 to 1,000 an hour and on up. On a typical medical doctor expert, you're going to spend probably a minimum of 25 to 35,000 before they testify at deposition and then again at trial. So it's a cost issue, but, but what's the flip side of being cheap? Then, then we're able to attack those experts at the time of trial. In fact, we're able to take away their credibility at the time of trial. And the reason we can take away their credibility is not because they are not credible witnesses. It's because they have to testify that they didn't review certain things in order to form their opinions, things that we would say are indispensable in forming their opinion. I'll give you a quick well, example. Um, yeah, and before that, you get into the example, guess what? Guess who did review all that materials? Our expert. So their expert didn't, our expert did, guess who wins? So that's right. the danger of being cheap. Right, and, and and here, like you like to say, let's step back just to make sure we're, we're talking about the right thing. So what are the th typical things in our trust and estate litigated matters that we give to an expert? We're gonna give the expert every email in the case. It doesn't matter if it's medical or not. We're gonna give them every single email. And sometimes there's you know several thousand pages of emails. We're gonna give them all text messages. Uh, those generally aren't as voluminous, but we're going to make sure they have everything. This is a big one. We're going to give them all the medical records, all the medical records, even of doctors that aren't psychiatrists and geriatric doctors. We're giving you all the medical records because we want to make sure that you reviewed all of those. And then deposition transcripts. We see this happen time and time again, where an opposing lawyer will not give their expert after they've been hired the updated deposition transcripts as they come along or only they, they only give them the deposition transcripts they want the, the expert to read. And even worse, many times they'll pull out 10 pages from a deposition transcript they want the expert to read. And these people are right for picking at the time of uh, deposition and trial because they have not reviewed the entirety of the case and then they form their opinions based on what they reviewed. Well, how can you give us a good opinion, Keith, if you don't know the whole story? And that's why you have to give them all of the evidence to review so that they're bulletproof at the time of their deposition. And they also are gonna be a much better historian of the facts if you give them everything. They're gonna sound credible. They're gonna sound like they know what they're talking about because they, they do know what they're talking about. They've reviewed the record and they have a good working relationship with it. Whereas, if you want to save a few bucks, uh, and maybe it's more than a few bucks, but if you want to save money, you're going to get what you pay for, and you're going to get an expert that likely is is going to get you know have have some issues at the time of deposition and trial. Yeah, it's the old saying: you're being you're being penny wise and pound foolish when you do that. And the problem is, like in our cases, our experts will have reviewed everything; their experts will have reviewed only a fraction. We win. I mean, our expert's going to be bulletproof. There isn't. I mean, you know. I mean, it's good for us if the other side does that, but it, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Yeah. So I was going to just share a, just a short war story, and that was when I was, uh, you know, a few years back, uh, and I was doing some dep uh, taking, learning how to take expert depots, which I really enjoy taking. Um, I went and met this expert in, at UCLA, and I'll and, and he'll remain he or she will remain nameless. Um, and the the expert had uh, been given information from the lawyer, and it was just a few excerpts of four deposition transcripts, and it was an expert of one medical record, just one medical record that had very favorable uh, info, but it was not in the context of the entire medical record. And so I was able to, uh, well, first of all, I started asking the expert just simple facts about the case. You know, who was the decedent? They, they got 
thought that out. How many kids did this person have? They had no idea. Where did this person live? No idea. I mean, I just asked question after question after question that they simply could not answer once I understood what they had brought to their the deposition to show what they had reviewed. They had reviewed nothing in the case. And so I was able to show, look, they don't, they form these opinions that are going to impact maybe millions of dollars transferring one way or the other, but they didn't do their homework judge or jury. They didn't do what they were required to do. And so their opinions aren't worth it. So let's 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 discount them appropriately. So um, that does happen. And so let me just move to my fifth and final point. And we see this as a problem too. And that is the supplemental information you need to give your experts. Uh, there's two types of supplemental information. There's voluntary supplemental information. And then there's the, the information that your lawyer or that the expert asks you for. And that may or may not be present, but at least they're asking. And I love it when an expert says to me, Stuart, is there any other medical record uh, on this issue? Or is there any other doctor that, that reviewed the patient on this issue? Uh, is there any other depositions I need to review in this matter? What, why is it, Keith, do you think I like it when an expert reaches out to me and asks for additional information? Well, because it shows that they're being thorough. And so then their opinions, again, are going to be more rock solid. So the more they know about the case, the more they know about the case facts, and the more that they're asking you for that information, and you're providing all of it, you're not the one who's trying to <clears throat> control the expert's opinion. You're letting the expert do their work, do their good work, being as thorough as they need to be. And then now their opinion looks far more uh, uh, legitimate and has a good solid basis. I think that's I think that's one of the primary uh, reasons we do that. The other reason I, I like to use it for is I like to ask the opposing expert, did you ever ask the other side for any additional information? And right. many times they say, no, I didn't ask for anything. You know, they gave me what they gave me and I made opinions. Um, and so I think it looks good when the expert is saying, hey, I'm curious about this. I want to know if there's something else here. And if there is something else there, you want to go get it as, as the lawyer and you want to give it to them. Now, the voluntary stuff that you give them, uh, and we saw this recently in a case where there was just a great deposition that was taken very, very late in the case uh, of another attorney that had, had come into the case uh, uh, for an, uh, another aspect. And that deposition was just really good for us. But the opposing lawyer who was at that deposition did not call all of his experts and say, here's this deposition. You need to read it. You need to consider it in form and make seeing if it changes your opinions. And the reason that's important, Keith, is if that lawyer had sent this one important deposition transcript to his experts, at least his experts are prepared at the time of trial to respond to it. And it usually goes something like this. Yes, I did receive that deposition transcript. Yes, I read it and reviewed it. And no, it didn't change my opinion because, and then they can say something. That is a much better response of an expert than, are you aware that this person's deposition was taken? No. no. Do you know what they testified to? No. Okay. I just want you to assume they testified to the following. Okay. Would that change your opinion in this case? And it doesn't matter which way they answer. It really hurts them. So um, those are the five tips that I have. Have we missed anything? No, I think those are the top five. I mean, you know, and if I were to, I mean, pick selecting your experts in the first instance is so vitally important, but I would put an asterisk and underline number four. I mean, providing all the information is probably the single most critical thing you can do. And you're right. I mean, when you get to trial and you're asking those questions and, and the great thing too, is that if the other side hasn't provided the expert with everything, then you get into these series of questions where you can say, well, did Mr. Opposing Attorney provide you with this deposition? No, he didn't. So you didn't review it. No, he didn't. And it sounds like they're withholding something. And it almost sounds nefarious. And it probably isn't. It probably is just cost savings and being cheap. But it works to such great advantage. So it's very important to know how to work with these expert witnesses. You're paying them a fortune. You might as well uh, get the most out of them. Uh, so, something that you just triggered in my mind, and, and it's something you and I've been trying to do recently, and it's 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 a high level tactic in in trial work, and that is, we want to give the hypothetical to the expert on the stand, and the reason we want to give the hypothetical is because we want to take the facts that we like in our case, and we want the fact finder, whether it's a judge or a jury to hear those facts over and over again. We don't want to bore them, but we want them to, to hear these facts. And so when, uh, for example, when, when the opposing expert had not reviewed this 
attorney's deposition transcript that was integral to the matter, um, he would say, okay, Mr. Expert, I, I want you to assume for the moment that this attorney met with this person and this was the conversation they had. And the conversation went as follows. <laughs> and you walk through the mm -hmm. conversation. So you're, you're educating everybody in the case as to what happened. And of course, you already know the expert's going to have to say, well, I didn't review that. Okay, so I, that you know, I, I'd have to look at that. I'd take the time to look at that. Well, we're here in trial. We're you have your opinions. So you know, what are your opinions as you sit there today? Um, so th that's a new tactic that we're trying. Um, some judges are more open to it than others because they get what's going on. Judges are sharp people. They see a lot of trials. Um, but if you don't cross the line, if you truly are setting up the hypothetical to make sure that that expert understands where you're going, I think it's a very useful method for educating the trier of fact. Yeah, absolutely. All right, expert witnesses, those are our top fives. Albertson and Davidson is here to help you fight for your inheritance. Check out aldavlaw.com for our complete library of helpful legal videos and articles from your favorite California trust and will litigation law firm, Albertson & Davidson, LLP.